Shout out to G-Man Boxing. All right, people. Review of the week time. This video, as always, the hit company. Thank you very much for being on board. Let's talk boxing. Now, before we talk about the boxing news that's happened over the last few days, let's talk about the cards that happened on Friday and Saturday. So obviously we had a top rank card on Friday and we also had the zone card on last night. Now, I'll start with the top rank card, it was on Friday. And early on in the year, we've already got a contender for fight of the year because this was brilliant. Emmanuel Navarrete versus Liam Wilson. Now, I'm gonna be frank, right? This kind of card, I guess for me, I was kind of like, ah, it's a bit, it's on a Friday, it's a bit under the radar. And I wasn't probably going to watch it. You know, I didn't watch it on the day, but I was thinking I'll probably only just look at the highlights the next day and just see how it went. But the highlights alone were enough to get me to watch it because this fight here with Wilson and Navarrete was amazing. Now, Navarrete, he, I think the original plan was for him to fight Oscar Valdez. And obviously they met in the ring after. So you'd imagine that fight is pretty much next because they're both top rank fighters. I'd never heard of Liam Wilson at all. He went into this fight 11-1. and one. And the worrying thing about this fight is this was fought at super featherweight. And Wilson was only a quarter of a pound over the featherweight limit. He was only 126 and a quarter pound. Which kind of implies that like he's not really struggling at all to make this weight. Um, I know Navarrete is the guy coming up. But that's a bit of a worry when you see that weight. And Liam Wilson, I mean, he really... He gave Navarrete a big scare. There's a lot of people talking about the knockdown which happened in this fight. Navarrete, he was hurt big time. He was hurt by a big left hook and then it was a flurry of punches he went down. He was given... Now, Navarrete spat his gum shield out and the referee put it back in pretty much straight away but he did take quite a bit of time. Now, it has to be said he did. However, one thing I think people are maybe looking over a little bit is that Navarrete... The last punch that was thrown was when he was basically down. So I think his knee, well, certainly one of his gloves was touching the ground when Wilson actually threw the last shot before the referee called the knockdown. He really should have stepped in right there and called it a knockdown and then administered the count. So there's kind of, I don't know, is it a case of two wrongs make a right in that situation? I don't really know. I'm not going to get into that. But I just thought I'd point that out that Navarrete, when he, he was technically down when the last punch went in. It was kind of a bit uh, the count the referee gave, to be fair. I know Navarrete being the home fighter. I know Bob Aram has put a lot of time into him. And I think he's got high hopes for Navarrete, truth be told. And so do I. I think he's a very, very good fighter. He was able to come back and pull this one out in the ninth. Tremendous fight, I have to say. In my opinion, very much an early candidate for fight of the year. Liam Wilson, he'll be in some good fights. I have to say, like I never heard of him. He's 26 and he's from... Australia, 11-2 and two now. His only loss, he actually avenged Joe Noya. And again, there's there's no names on here, forgive my ignorance, that I could really look at and say I recognise. So obviously he is one of those fighters who, I mean, you want to call him someone who's just come onto the scene, maybe he's had a bit of bad luck in his career. Obviously Nico Ali Walsh, the grandson of Muhammad Ali, fought. Richard Torres actually fought on this card as well. Richard Torres is a heavyweight. He's... He lost, he's a silver medalist. He lost to Yalilov in the final of Tokyo 2020, which was in 2021, technically. But he is a heavyweight who's on the up and coming. He's up and coming. And, you know, 23 years old, six foot two, so he's not the biggest heavyweight you'd ever see. But there's definitely a lot of potential there. There is definitely a lot of potential there. And as well on the card, Arnold Bambraza Jr. He defeated uh, Jose Pedraza on a 10-round UD. That's a good win. Jose Pedraza is still... He's still no pushover, even at this stage. So that was the top rank card. And let's get on to the zone card. So this card was obviously headlined by Amanda Serrano versus Erica Cruz Hernandez. Very, very good fight. Enjoyed this fight. Caught up on this this morning. Serrano, the deserved winner, but it was a very, very good fight nonetheless. Now, she will face Katie Taylor on May the 20th so before I talk about the rest of the card we'll talk about this really really quick I've already touched on it briefly as it happens now we know the fight is happening in Dublin right that much we know we just don't know where the arena is going to be 
Now, the tree arena, I really hope it's not there. Because to be honest with you, you may as well have it in MSG. Because the tree arena is tiny. It's not tiny, but it's kind of Wembley Arena type, if you know what I mean. Maybe a bit smaller. In fact, I think it is a little bit smaller than the Wembley Arena. So for a homecoming, I mean, really, uh, you couldn't really do that. So Crow Park, obviously, is the main place where we want it. But obviously, no surprise, the GAA being their usual, you know what, they are making it difficult. They're making it difficult. They're looking for a lot of money, etc. And Conor McGregor, interestingly, said to Eddie Hearn on Twitter that he'd be willing to pay the security fee, I believe it was. So Hearn apparently reached out to McGregor and said, check your DMs and... What's happening with that now, I don't know. At the end of the day, I hope they can get it in Crow Park. It is a big arena. Um, the atmosphere would be amazing. I'm happy regardless that it's happening in Dublin. I am. But I'd like it to be somewhere big. Because I genuinely think Kate Hader could probably do. In fact, I'd say she definitely could do Crow Park. Because she is, in Ireland, just... She's massive. She's a star to people who don't even watch boxing. So a lot of people would go and be interested and would go to this fight for the sole purpose that Katie Taylor was headlining. They wouldn't even be boxing fans. They wouldn't be the sort of people who'd even know. Probably if you said to them, Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, they'd be just like, um, I heard the name, um, what did I do again? That, that'd be the kind of people, but they love Katie Taylor. So they would go just to support her. And I think in terms of, like I've heard on the undercard, there's talk of Dennis Hogan versus... James Metcalf and that's a good fight for the IBO title at 154 that's a decent fight you get people like Gary Culling on the undercard and it would probably be a lot of Irish fights you know maybe some Irish dust ups or you'd certainly see a lot of Irish talent be on the card for definite you know I heard people asking could we get Conlon Wood rematch I, d I doubt that very much I doubt that very much but you'll definitely get a lot of names on it Irish names on it and I think it'd be good for the sport certainly in Ireland to grow it because they need an event like that. Yes, there's more events happening in Dublin now. There's one happening in April, I think it is. Jay Quigley's going to main event that. But in terms of big shows, I mean, Jesus Christ, you're going to have to go back to oh, pre-2010, the Bernard Dunn days, before there was any real big shows in Ireland. I mean, that's really... I suppose that Matthew Macklin show where he got knocked out by that guy, I can't remember who the guy's name was, Charles Fom. That wasn't really a big show. And that wasn't the tree arena. So that gives you an idea just kind of how it is. So, yeah, hopefully they can get it in Crow Park by hook or by crook. In terms of the undercard, obviously, Elise Bam Gardner, she picked up Undisputed at £130 in a very good fight as well. Her power really shone through in that fight. Obviously, Michaela Meyer. There's a lot of talk about her having the rematch with Michaela Meyer. Now, for me personally, going into the fight they had back in September, actually, it was in October, actually, I picked Elisa Van Garner to win that fight. However, I do think Michaela Meyer was a bit unlucky not to get the nod. It was a close fight. Certainly, Van Gardner had her moments. But I felt that Meyer just nicked it. She just, just about nicked it. Now, to be honest with you, a lot of people were saying robbery. No, it was a it was a close fight. It could have went either way. I was surprised, truth be told, they gave it to Van Gardner. Truth be told, because... She was, well, she's a disown fighter fighting on Sky, basically. So I was like, uh, unlikely you're going to get the nod there. But she did. She did. She got the nod. So they're talking about doing that as a rematch next. Obviously, with that rematch, Elisa Van Gardner, she really does have, well, she has it all. Like, I mean, she is the A side going into that fight. So we'll see if they can do that. In terms of boxing news that's being talked about, I think the big news that came out from last week, which broke on February the 1st by Mike Coppinger, was that Fury versus Usyk is reportedly targeted for April the 29th. Now, I'm going to be frank, people, right? Do I doubt that that fight will happen on that day? I'm going to say no. I do think it will happen this year, and I think it's going to happen in around that time. But where is it going to take place is the question. I'm hearing so many people... And what would I call it? They would be... Some of them would be more in the know than others. Put it like that. They'd be boxing websites and forums. And I'd see them tweeting this, that, and the other. And some of them you kind of... There's some... I'd, I'm just going to sound bad. like, But there's some where if they tell me it's going to be in Wembley, I'm like, all right, it's going to be in Saudi. So, Do you know, that sort of way. But I'm kind of seeing 50-50. There's some reporting and they're saying they've heard on the grapevine it's definitely going to be in Wembley. And then others are saying, no, 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 it's definitely going to be in Saudi. 
So it looks like they're the two leading contenders to host this fight. Where it is, that much I don't know. Um, or who's the leader in terms of where it's likely going to be, that much I don't know. I, I would guess that for maximum profit, probably going to be Saudi. In terms of just sheer purses for the fighters. In terms of the show as a whole... Um, well, again, I don't know how much the tickets would be going in Saudi, but I can imagine the cheap seats up there in the rafters in Wembley be pretty damn cheap. So we'll wait and see. Look, at the end of the day, I want to see these two guys get it on in the ring. They're the best in the division. One and two. Whatever order you want, you put them in it. I really want this fight. And for both guys, you know, I really think that neither guy has any other option. Or not say they have any other option. They do have other options. But I think that they need each other. They need to fight each other. It's one and two. It's undisputed. And I think as well as that, there's, as I've said before, there's no reason now at this minute in time. There's no mandatories. There's no any real hurdle that both these guys need to overcome in order to get this fight over the line. It's there ready to go. So for me, nothing else will do for Usek or for Fury to fight one another. And again, like if Usek came out tomorrow and said, you know what, I fancy a trilogy with Joshua. I'd be like, nah, mate. I'm not giving you a pass on that. And vice versa with Fury if he decided I'm going to fight Ngadio. It's like, nah, mate, Usek, nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. We need to get this fight over the line. It's been too long. It's been, a lot, as I said in the documentary, it's been a long road to undispute, a very long road. And the last seven years or so, there thereabouts, it's just been, it's been one thing after another. Now we're in a situation where it looks like it's quite near. And let's just get this over the line. Let's get this over the line. Ben Shalom has been talking about Eubank Jr. and saying that he's going to activate the rematch clause for his fight against Liam Smith. So it looks to me as though we're getting at some point maybe this summer Liam Smith versus Chris Eubank Jr. again. And I was thinking to myself about this today and I was I was looking at just clips of Billy Joe Saunders, the little clips we've seen of him. And at the end of the day, like he still looks in pretty damn bad shape. Now, he is still talking about coming back and, you know... I don't think there's much point in it, truth be told, because I think that he's going to be a shell of himself. I think at this stage, you know, if he was in his mid-twenties, might get away with it. You know, might get away with it. But right now, he's got to be, what, 32, 33? Older, 34, give or take. So, I can't see him getting away with it and even being a shell of himself. Being a shell of the man who fought Canelo almost two years ago now. So, I'd say Billy Joe is there for the taking. If you're Eubank Jr., do you want to avenge the loss to Liam Smith or do you want to avenge the loss to Billy Joe Saunders? Because you lost to both guys and one at this stage is definitely more winnable than the other and it's not Liam Smith, it's Billy Joe Saunders. If you're Eubank Jr., personally, if I was advising him, I'd be saying, look, how bad do you want, and again, you got to think of what kind of money's on the table, I suppose, but how bad do you want Liam Smith? Do you want to stay at 160 where, you know, let's be frank, like it's it's probably not easy for you to make that weight. And Liam Smith is the A-side this time, so it's going to be where he says, and he may very well, like he's talked about it, saying I might bring you down to 158 or something like that. So it ain't going to be easy. You are definitely the B-side for Liam Smith. Billy Joe Saunders, it's more even Stevens. You know, it'll probably be at 168 because there's no way he's making 160 again. Look at the way he looks. So you're, you're probably at a higher weight. He's not the same fight. Like Liam Smith hasn't blown up over the last two years. And God knows what Billy Joe has been doing the last two. I don't even want to know. But Liam Smith is the consummate professional. So he's not going to go and have to take a lot of weight off and maybe have to detox from God knows what. Liam Smith's just going to be there ready to go. Whereas Billy Joe Saunders, it's going to be an easier fight. There's beef there. There's needle there. Would they put it on pay-per-view? I don't doubt that they would. Ben Shalom probably would do it. You know, pay-per-view, the rematch, the grudge match, Junior versus Billy Joe Saunders too. And you probably get, I mean, the fans would tune in because there's there's real needle there and both guys could get a reaction out of the other. So with that, that's probably the easier road to go if you're Eubank. If you want the bigger payday and you're more assured of a win. If you want to go down the Liam Smith road, you're going to have to accept probably being the B-side, which I'm sure he's probably come to the realisation that he is for this fight because he took a pretty bad L. And, yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't be picking over Liam Smith this time. 
First time around, I thought, yeah, he's going to beat him. I did. I thought he's going to beat Liam Smith because I just thought stylistically he's tailor made. But um, having seen that, that's going to be hard to come back from. Because, again, I thought Junior was coming into it in the third round in that fight. He was. But it, this wasn't like Dylan White versus Povetkin, where you see one fighter is just a shell of himself and he's getting dropped a couple of times. And Dylan White makes one mistake, gets taken out in one shot. You see that and you think, okay, look, it was bad. But realistically, like 95% of that fight, you were in complete control. It wasn't even competitive. And you made one mistake. With this fight, I felt that Eubank was doing more of what he wanted, truth be told, especially in the third round. But it was never like Liam Smith was out of his depth. He knew what he was doing and there, knew what he wanted to do. And then he was able to capitalize on some mistakes from Eubank. So it wasn't like he was down, taking a big beat or anything like that. He was giving as good as he was getting. So I can't see how Junior wins this fight. I really can't. Really can't. Obviously, the big fight that was announced is that Joe Joyce will face Zili Zhang. And that's going to be on April the 15th at the Copper Box. Now, that's going to be a big night of boxing because April 15th is reportedly the day we're going to get uh, Ryan Garcia versus Tank Davis. So we're going to have that card on our time at night, probably about 10, half 10. And then it's only a couple of hours wait until Tank Davis versus Garcia. So it's going to be a big night of boxing that night. So... I think that's a that's an all-nighter, definitely. That's 100% an all-nighter because normally if there's a big fight on, they tend to, in the States, I mean, tends to not normally be anything on this side of the pond. Normally, anyway. So it's a normal case of, right, do you stay up or do you have a kip at about 10 o'clock, wake up at about 2 and then soldier on through until the sun comes up. So there's going to be a big night of boxing. In terms of Joyce versus Zhang, I mean... Damn, I give him credit for that. You know, Zili Zhang, he's definitely a top 15 heavyweight. I think that's fair to say. He arguably beat Philip, Philip Hergovich. Uh, I was going to call him Philip Hunter there because I was thinking of, I was thinking in my head of Michael Hunter there and I was I was going to actually say Philip Hunter. No, he nearly beat Philip Hergovich or in many people's eyes did beat him, was very unlucky not to get the nod. Very much a big puncher, decent hand speed. I think the stamina let's Zili Zhang down and that seems to be an issue that's persistent in his fights you know you see that when he goes obviously when he's getting these guys out of there early it's not but when he's going late you do see him be a bit more stationary a bit easier to hit and his output drops significantly so him against Joyce I think it's going to be an interesting fight look I think Joe Joyce is better I think he's better than Hergovic so I think he's just going to win but it's dangerous, you know, it's a real, I'm happy about this fight, don't get me wrong, but you look at it and you think, boy, you took a risk there, you know, you're taking a, a bit of a risk there fighting this guy, especially when you don't need to, you know, but look, don't get me wrong, I'm happy with it, I think it's going to be a very, very entertaining fight as long as it lasts, because it's, I don't see this fight going 12 rounds, just truth be told, I think someone's getting knocked out, and, you know, I really did think that they would take that interim title and they would not wait it out, but they'd have, you know, a, a bit of a gimme fight or two until they knew what the situation was with Fury Usek, whether they'd be fighting the winner of Fury Usek or they'd be elevated the full champion. So credit to Joe Joyce for taking this fight. I'm very happy with it, as I said. And on to the next one. Now, Dylan White. So he's given his thoughts on Joshua versus Franklin. And it's safe to say he's not happy. Now... He used a couple of words here, which I'm not going to mention. You kind of know what they are. He says, I would have been better off losing to Franklin and getting the AJ fight. It's protecting AJ. They know if he loses again, he'll probably jack it in. And a lot of people will be left with limb something in their hands. So Dylan White, obviously not happy with this situation. Now, Dylan White, obviously, I, I did think he would be AJ's comeback opponent, truth be told, because it seemed almost as if it was set up for that. And as he says himself, you know, the winner of Dylan White versus Franklin was going to be AJ's next opponent. And he beat Franklin, Franklin lost, and Franklin is going to be AJ's next opponent. So you can kind of see where he's coming from there. I think with Dylan White... Look, I think Dylan White is going to have a fight before he fights Joshua in the summer, provided, of course, Joshua gets by Franklin, and you never know. 
And we're hearing Oliver Lane being mentioned. And I think that's a risky fight. I do. I think that's a risky fight. And I think Dylan White, maybe he knows deep down that that's a risky fight. And he knows he's coming near the end. He wants to. And he is coming near the end. Let's not beat around the bush here. He is. And he probably knows, right, I want to make as much money as I can before it's all said and done. Because I think that if he wanted a shot at a title, he would be going the Dubois route. I do. I think he'd be waiting it out for Dubois. He's not doing that. He wants the AJ fight, which I don't think he'll win. And I think he's probably looking at this situation and thinking, I want the Joshua now. Now he's fighting the guy I just beat. And now I'm going to have to fight out of a lane. Now bear in mind, right, it kind of puts it a bit more in context now. When Dylan White was signed to fight out of a lane back in 2021, he pulled out of that fight. What I think a, was about two or three weeks notice. It wasn't long. Didn't give much notice and pulled out with a sighted shoulder injury. Didn't look injured to me. You know, I think he was actually there at the event and looked perfect. And with the way he performed against Fury and the way he's performed against Franklin, maybe they kind of knew, all right, look, he's going to be a bit of a risk. And maybe his team were kind of like, we're not too sure. Let's not risk it. Let's just go for the Fury fight. I think that's what they did. And I think maybe he's he knows himself. Dylan White's not stupid. He knows himself. Maybe he knows himself that, look, I'm coming near the end now. I'm not the fighter I was 2017, 2018. And fighting an Oliver Lane now, when I want this AJ fight, I want that payday. Hey, I'm not convinced that I'm going to get through him. Obviously, he's obviously not going to say that. But maybe that's what he's thinking. Maybe that's why he's so animated and annoyed with Eddie Hearn over this situation. That he's thinking, hang on a minute. I wanted this this AJ payday. You're making me fight arguably a harder fight. You know, you could arguably say that out of a lane. I know a lot of people don't really rate out of a lane and ah, I think he's an okay fighter. I don't I think he's better put it like, I think he's better than Franklin. I do. I think he's better than Jermaine Franklin. So Dylan White could be looking and saying, You're making me have a harder fight now. And I might not win this fight. Joshua is fighting the guy I just beat. And now I have to get through this guy just to fight Joshua. So he's probably thinking he's being taken around the bend here. So maybe that's why he's kind of being a bit more animated and just saying, you know, F you, basically. So that's the situation with Dylan White. Now, I also see here, and gee, this next one is really just something else. But before I get that, uh, obviously spoke with this in the video yesterday that Lawrence Coley avoid, appointed Sugar Hill Stewart is his new trainer, replacing Shane McGuigan. Apparently, I know now that it was purely just geographical reasons, um, which is why him and McGuigan split, which is understandable, understandable enough. That's happened to a few fighters. I think that was what... Was that what happened with Dylan? Well, apparently that was what happened with Dylan White and Mark Tibbs, wasn't it? That Dylan White was basing himself over there in Portugal and Mark Tibbs just wasn't willing to travel. So he's with Sugar Hill Stewart now. Don't expect to see any significant improvements in the David Life fight that's coming up because it's just too short a notice. So with Lawrence Acoli, if we're going to see any improvements, we're probably going to see them later on this year as opposed to now. Now, Eddie Hearn said this, and I mean, just, ah, uh, why? So he's revealed there have been minor discussions with Manny Pacquiao about making Manny Pacquiao versus Conor Ben. I would not be surprised to see Conor Ben fight Pacquiao next. <laughs> I mean, just ah, uh, Pacquiao is he's 42, 43 and he's not fought in nearly 2 years and if you want to be a bit more brutal, he's had 3 fights in 4 years. I just, and he's coming off the back of a loss. This is like the time where he tried to sell us that Chris Algieri was a top 15 welterweight. Just, just no. Just, I don't understand it, you know. It really is just trying to milk. And look, at the end of the day, worry about the UCAD situation with Conor Ben. Right, worry about that. I want to know what the situation is with UCAD before you start talking about fights. But the names he's always listing. For Conor Ben, he's been doing this for a while. It's like, we're not stupid. You know, the people who watch your IFL interviews, they are not stupid. Majority of them are going to be the hardcore fans. 
So they know that saying something like Robert Guerrero and Chris Algieri, top 15 welterweights, is complete BS. And it's the same with trying to get a retired ancient Manny Pacquiao out of retirement. And when he says minor discussions, that could be nothing more than an email just saying, would you be interested? That could be what the minor discussion is. You know, when they say discussions, Frank Warren is, is great for doing this. Where he'll be like, oh yeah, there's discussions going on. It could be nothing more than him just sending an email to that fighter. You know, that literally could be the height of it. So, with regards to this one, just worry about what's going on with the UCAD, British Boxing Board of Control situation before you start talking about bringing fighters who should have retired probably before he fought your Danish UGAS, long before that, should have retired after the tournament fight, back out of retirement. That's what I got to say on that. So, I'll leave it with there. I'll leave it there. Um, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. There's not been... I think this weekend's been a bit quiet, you know, apart from the cars that have been on. There's not really been that much news coming out. Um, so hopefully this next week we get a bit more. I'll try and get a live in this week. I've actually, because obviously tomorrow is a bank holiday in Ireland. And obviously in the bank holiday I try and get a little bit more in. I try and do a little bit more recording. I have an idea for a video and I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a chance to record it tomorrow. Might even upload it tomorrow if the editing works out well enough. So... Stay tuned for that. I'm probably going to blow this tonight if I have the time. And we'll wait and see what else happens in the week. But other than that, I hope you all have a fantastic week. As I always say, I hope the phone rings with good news for someone in the coming weeks, myself included. And yeah, I'll leave you with that. If you could, people, on the way out, smash the like button. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. We're only three subs off. 10,400. Boom. Happy days. So I'll leave it there, people. Smash the like button. Have a great week. Hope you enjoy the video, people. Peace.